Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea. This weekly podcast focuses on discussing practical tips and techniques that you can use in life to find your inner peace and happiness. If you have suggestions for topics, let me know through social media, this site, or email. My contact information is found at my website, lifesjourneyblog.com. This episode is a recently recorded interview I had with author and blogger John Vespasian. John Vespasian is the author of seven books focused on rational living, wherein he speaks about how positive thinking alone does not contribute to a joyful life. It also takes a rational mind and analytic approach. His first book is entitled, When Everything Fails, Try This. And his most recent book is titled, On Becoming Unbreakable, how normal people can become extraordinarily self-confident. You can find all of his books over on Amazon. And thank you, John, for joining us. And uh, to start off, can you please tell us a bit about yourself and what led you to write about the topic of rational living? <clears throat> yes, uh, Chris, uh, thanks uh, for having me on. I started to write books in uh, 2008, after being a voracious reader of uh, personal development books, of philosophy, history, psychology for many years, at a certain point, I grew um, very dissatisfied with the, with the books I was reading because I found them very repetitive, uh, very superficial, and very unrealistic. Because uh, most uh, personal development authors, uh, they quote each other, uh, they tell the same stories, and they try to present uh, the conclusions before they actually um, analyze the facts. And I thought at that point that uh, I could uh, write books myself, I could uh, try a different approach, and this is what I have been doing uh, since 2008, uh, trying to write books about uh, rational living based on real cases, based on history, based on uh, real people, on real situations, and trying to draw conclusions from uh, specific cases trying to draw general conclusions that anybody can apply in his life. Okay, and can you kind of define for us your uh, view of what is rational living? Yes, I would uh, define rational living as a branch of um, uh, personal development or philosophy or psychology, which is based on a very simple idea. And the idea is the following. Uh, If you just uh, try to make uh, rational decisions in your life and to implement them consistently, uh, in the long term, uh, you will do much better. The idea is very simple. Uh, Taking rational decisions is going to increase your chances of success, happiness, exponentially. Uh, Because uh, in the long term, uh, even if you have some adversity, even if you have bad luck, which everybody is going to have uh, some in uh, his life, Eventually, if you try to make rational decisions uh, on a systematic basis, uh, you will make many, many right decisions, many more than wrong decisions, and in the long term, uh, you will tend to do very well. Given enough time, uh, taking a rational approach uh, to at least to the important things in life is going to uh, increase your chances of having a better life um, dramatically. Right. Because if we begin to view our lives from a rational perspective versus an irrational one, I guess in that sense, our thought processes would be leading us in a way toward that which creates happiness. Well, um, yes, but on the other hand, um, one of the central points of rational living is that you have to accept that uh, in the human psychology, in the human mind, in the human nature, there is a very strong factor of irrationality. And we have to deal with it because to a certain extent uh, we're also animals and we tend to Mm -hmm. panic uh, when we face uh, danger, when we face adversity, 
when we face opposition. And this irrational factor in our psychology is very, very strong. It's, an, it's a factor that you will never be able to eliminate uh, completely. And it's not the idea to eliminate uh, completely your uh, emotions. I mean, of course not. The idea is to be conscious of uh, this tendency to irrationality. And when you are making important decisions about your career, about your investments, about your relationships, about uh, your life in general, when you're making critical decisions, you have to take into account <clears throat> that uh, emotions might be leading you in the wrong direction. And this is why I strongly recommend in my books uh, to study the cases of people who have uh, gone through different, through similar problems, people who have um, been successful or who have uh, not been successful, and to try to learn from their stories because this will um, improve your reflexes, it will improve your skills at making um, rational decisions, your skills at uh, choosing the right path. And this is very difficult to do on a systematic basis because even if you, if you, um, if you uh, take rationality as a goal and say, yeah, yeah, I want to be rational, to do it every day and to do it uh, when you are afraid, when you are scared, when you're having problems is really very difficult because uh, all of us, when we're facing uh, great problems, uh, sorry, uh, severe problems, we tend to panic and we tend to do um, what animals do, which is uh, to run scared, uh, to fight um, in the wrong way and basically to harm ourselves. This is why it's so important to train yourself when you're doing well to be able to react uh, appropriately when you have problems. Right, and I really enjoy uh, when you're making this connection between us and the animals because in my experience, I have noticed that many people tend to forget that we ourselves as humans are animals and that we do have an instinct within ourselves uh, that is still very animalistic and that we still react and respond. And, and I think many people have figured we've evolved uh, beyond that. But it sounds like in, in making the connections that you are that maybe we haven't necessarily on that level uh, evolved uh, much beyond. Um, well, we have evolved, um, certainly human society is much better now than it was uh, 100 years or 200 years ago. <clears throat> so we are improving. But the question is that at any moment, you can go back uh, to the pure emotional, animal emotions on the, on the tick of a the, of the second. You can just go back immediately because unless you train yourself to stay calm, uh, to face adversity with, uh, with intelligence, with um, with uh, um, uh, say alertness, and if you really train yourself and you you formulate this as a goal, it's very easy to panic. It's very easy in, the, in a crisis to do the wrong thing and to to cause uh, permanent damage to your life. And um, I mean, I, I have only found one way uh, to increase um, uh, the ability to make to make uh, good decisions. And the only way I have found is really to study history, uh, to see many, many different situations, uh, many, many different people who have become successful, or who have been failures, or who have uh, been able to overcome problems. It's only through the study of history, to, through the study of real cases, that I have been able to increase my ability to make decisions. Because to learn the theory and to learn the, some, uh, I would say, mantra, say, you are, you are going to make it, you are going to make it, I mean, this kind of stuff, of positive thinking, I think is very superficial. It doesn't go deep enough, and I don't think it has the power to increase your uh, capacity to uh, to make good decisions in critical situations. Right. So when you mention that, you know, I, I do notice in in your works you do talk a lot about history and bringing historical figures. Are you doing that in the sense of we can learn from our history so we don't? repeat the bad uh what you know what, what was the focus for you to put this on in history because a lot of what i've read from other people when i've studied uh rational therapies and uh some of the other uh psychological books that i've looked at 
I've never seen where people focus so much on history and historical figures to bring it into modern day life. And actually, I appreciate that uh, as a person who loves history myself. Uh, so what, where was your focus to bring about history in your books? Well, <clears throat> the focus is to learn uh, from real situations. And I see history, I think the right uh, way to study history, to read history, is to read uh, specific stories. Of course, uh, you have to place the stories in their context. To read specific stories and to try to draw a lesson which is universal and which is applicable to your situation, because otherwise the story is, uh, is a waste of time. And let me give you an example. One of, okay. the, principles, one of the principles that uh, I really underline in my books is that it's a complete waste of time uh, in most cases, I mean, not 100%, but it's usually a complete waste of time uh, to try to argue with people, to try to convince uh, other people of uh, something which for you might be obvious, might be right, might be self-evident, but all human beings, um, we have the tendency uh, to be very, very adverse to, to, to criticism. Uh, when someone tells you, Chris, you're wrong, immediately your reaction is going to be, no, 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 I'm right, you're wrong. And when it goes right. into, into really um, some fundamental question about uh, your behavior, your attitudes, your taste, your goals, uh, the reaction, the emotional reaction is, is usually very strong. So in my books, I, I, I really underline the principle, and I consider a, a principle of rational living, that usually it's a waste of time to try to convince everybody. I mean, if you can convince 5% uh, of the people you talk to about your views and to move them uh, in the right direction, five. For three percent is already an achievement, but to try to convince everybody to try to, try to be a crusader, I think usually is a waste of time. And one of the stories I tell in my books is the story of Confucius, who was a, I mean, a famous uh, Oriental uh, uh, wise man from the fourth, uh, fifth century before Christ. And Confucius mm -hmm. has spent, uh, I mean, he, he didn't write anything. I mean, they are writings that basically were made by his disciples. But Confucius was a great teacher. I mean, similar to Jesus Christ in, um, in Western Europe, I mean, he was uh, in China. But Confucius has spent um, more than 10 years of his life uh, walking around China and trying to preach uh, his theories, his ethical theories, his uh, philosophical theories, uh, going from village to village, uh, trying to teach people the right way and the right uh, thing to do. And I tell you, after 10 years, he was completely disgusted. He went back to his village. And his conclusion was, it's a waste of time. I cannot even get uh, two people to, to believe my ideas. And this happens right. all the time. It's the human condition. So one of the things uh, that I really underlined in my books, and it's a, it's a lesson from history, it is if you have um, a strong convictions and you think you're doing the right thing, try to focus on the people who more or less are already moving in the right direction. And forget about the rest, because to become a crusader and try to convince 100% uh, of the people is a complete waste of time, and most of the time is going to be counterproductive. Right, and I really like how you bring that up with Confucius, because I think there's a lot of people who are very either spiritual or very passionate people about certain causes, but they either get discouraged in the cause or the cause doesn't take off, you know, like uh, they would expect, uh, or, you know, things go awry. You know, you, you think here in the, in the United States, a uh, few people, you know, who end up being assassinated or, you know, you bring up, you know, uh, uh, Jesus and, you know, he gets uh, tortured and killed. So I think in what you're saying throughout the history, that if we look at this from just passion alone, it may not be enough to propel widespread change in people and their attitudes. Yes, um, this does not mean that, of course, uh, you should uh, uh, keep silent when you see a great injustice. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, uh, turning um, their eyes and, and not looking at reality, not at all. But I'm just saying that if you just want to change the world for the better and you want to, to, um, to put your ideas uh, in, real, in practice or you want to, to make some positive change, most of the time, and this is one of also another principle that I really um, underline in my books, most of the time you are going to do much better uh, by taking an entrepreneurial approach to becoming an entrepreneur, not necessarily, not necessarily by building a, a, a huge business, could be a small business or could be a professional, could be 
some kind of um, uh, activity. But you have to try to do it on a profitable basis. You have to try to make money, at least not to lose money, to keep it on a sustainable basis. Uh, most um, uh, ideas and most uh, passions and most uh, convictions, you can find a way if you really take the time, if you really stay uh, calm and uh, focused, most of the time you're going to be able to find at least one way or several ways to turn your ideas or your convictions into some kind of business or at least some, some, some kind of uh, self-sustaining self activity that will allow you to cover your cost, it will allow you to expand, and it will allow you to make a living. I think what uh, you should uh, avoid at all costs is to go into a suicidal uh, crusade that is going to destroy your life, it's going to undermine your finances, and basically it's going to, uh, to wipe out uh, your future. I mean, this kind of thing we have seen in history many, many, many times. I give many examples in my books, and this is not the way to go. And let me right. just give you another example quickly that I find sure. um, very, very impressive uh, in history. And it's the story of the, of the Valdesians. Valdesians was a heresy, uh, I think it was uh, in the 11th century in, uh, in uh, history. And it was started by a guy, his name was uh, Peter Waldo, who lived in France. And the guy was, uh, was a businessman. He had, um, he had a textile factory. It was very, very famous in his area. He made uh, very, very high-quality textiles in the north of France. And he got uh, very worried, like many people today, very worried about uh, the terrible state of society because there were so many injustices, so many poor people, so much violence. I mean, you can imagine mm -hmm. the 11th century in France. I mean, the guy was really losing his sleep about uh, the situation of the world. And then he went, right. to a, um, he went to a priest to ask, okay, what should I do? I mean, the situation is so bad. I mean, the world is really a terrible place. And then he got uh, the, um, the recommendation uh, to follow uh, the Bible. So the guy could not uh, read Latin, so he had to pay someone to translate uh, the, the uh, gospel into, uh, into ancient French because he, he could speak French but not uh, Latin. So he got the mm -hmm. translation. He paid the guy to translate, and he read the, the, the gospel, and then he got the message, okay, the, the way to go is actually to, to give away any, everything you have and to go a preaching. Uh, literally, this is what the gospel in some uh, passages, you get this message. You should give everything away and just um, go preaching uh, village to village. So this is what Waldo actually did. He sold, I mean, he gave away everything he had. He gave away his factory. He closed down the factory. He gave away his house. He gave away uh, all the money he had, and he kept only uh, his clothes and a pair of sandals. And then he went uh, preaching in France, village to village, uh, for the next 10 years. And he was very successful. But the problem is that uh, the, the effect that he, um, he obtained, the result of his preaching, was completely the opposite of what he wanted. Because many people actually quit uh, their jobs and quit their factories, and they closed down. Uh, it was a huge uh, economic problem uh, in the area where he lived because actually he destroyed about 300 jobs. And mm -hmm. Everybody who was joining the Waldation heresy was actually just walking away from his job, walking away from his business, joining uh, Waldo, walking around in the village uh, basically asking for money and preaching uh, the kingdom of uh, heaven. And after uh, 50 years, the Catholic Church started to prosecute them because they were basically destroying the whole economy. And, and uh, the message from that is that, yes, uh, you can find uh, good answers in, uh, in the Bible, you can find good answers in religion, good answers in philosophy, but in the end you have to use common sense. And you should right. not take things uh, literally, and you should not take uh, extreme positions that uh, are against uh, common sense, because if everybody did like this Waldo, I mean, we would all be walking around uh, begging for money, nobody would be working, and it would not uh, be feasible. So you have to be realistic in what you want, and you have to learn from history that many ideas that you still hear today, they don't work in practice. Right. And I think that really plays well into one of the uh, quotes that I really like from your uh, book on the 10 principles of rational living. And uh, the quote is, Anyone who wants to attain happiness and effectiveness must start by adopting an entrepreneurial attitude. So are you talking about if we really want to be happy that we need to start a business, or are you just talking about 
that happiness can come out of having that sense of, I guess, realism and the common sense that you mentioned, that that's how we need to approach the world as if we were building that business or are you looking at a business itself? No, <clears throat> what I mean by entrepreneurial attitude I'm using the word uh, entrepreneurial in a wide philosophical sense. I'm not talking about uh, starting a business. I mean, not necessarily everybody should start a business. In many cases, uh, you can make uh, a very good living just by working for someone else if you have uh, a good job. Not necessarily, but what I mean by entrepreneurial is mean the attitude, the general attitude uh, to life uh, towards uh, your relationships, towards uh, uh, your career, your investment. You have to take action. You have to really uh, plan ahead. You have to think about your goals, and you have to take um, uh, steps to improve your situation, and indirectly you would be improving the world. What uh, the opposite of entrepreneurship is not uh, having a job. The opposite of entrepreneurship is passivity. And if you just uh, okay. accept uh, the problems, uh, say you have a medical condition, or you have uh, uh, an investment failure, or you have a career problem, if you just accept things without taking action, this is no good. I think uh, one of the principles of rational living is to take action, to be entrepreneurial in the sense of uh, planning ahead, looking for opportunities, trying to improve your life. And it does not mean literally to start a business, but it means to take action, which might be uh, to, be, to get a better job, to, to move to a, to a different location, uh, to learn new skills. In the end, you have to take action well, you have a business or not, you have to take actions in different areas of your life in order to improve your situation. Right, so using those uh, acumens that a business person or entrepreneur would use, uh, we can uh, apply that into our own lives and move forward in that. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about reading your works is that notion of taking action. You know, a lot of my writing focuses around the fact that, you know, you don't sit by passively and in that sense become a victim of the circumstance. In other words, what we would want to do is take action in our lives and therefore not become the victims, but become a creator or, or, or uh, an originator uh, and be able to make a difference uh, in the world, which when I was looking at your latest blog post, um, and the title of that one being Serenity and Efficiency Begin with Clarity. Uh, you posted it recently. That yes, notion uh, of... Pardon? Yes, go, go ahead, Chris, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, you look at uh, the notion here of uh, having a simplicity or a simplification of life, a, a uh, less complexity, and the line in here that I really liked uh, for many reasons, and, and I think this line could probably become multiple blog posts in, in and of itself, but when you talk about people who shun uh, simplification, you write, what they dread, like mice running in circles, is to stand still for a minute and question their contradictions. What do you think is the reason why we don't want to question our contradictions? Well, the, the reason um, is uh, actually it was discovered only uh, theoretically, it was discovered only in the in the um, in the 19th century, and this is a concept uh, that in economics is called uh, time preference, and it's a concept that uh, is rarely applied in psychology, but it was discovered in economics, and the idea is the following. Um, uh, Automatically, I mean, children and uh, animals and uh, actually people who don't think about the future, they tend to have a time preference, which means that they, they, they have to uh, focus on the present and they find very difficult uh, to sacrifice uh, present time for future benefits. So they have an extreme focus on the present. While uh, people who actually tend to achieve more and to tend to, to achieve uh, higher levels of happiness and higher levels of success, they have a time preference which is shifted, and they are able to think uh, that in five years I'm going to do this, and in 10 years I'm going to do that, and in 15 years I'm going to do that. And they are able to sacrifice uh, short-term uh, investment or work or deprivation even. They are able to think about uh, the long-term, 
and they are able to understand that if they invest uh, one hour of work or one dollar or one uh, year uh, today to learn something or to do something, they will profit uh, in the next decades uh, many, many times, and they will earn more, they will live better, and they will be happier. And this, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, story of the time preference, which is in economics, it plays a, a big um, role in the determination of interest rates. In the, in the field of psychology, it means that if you have a time preference, which is basically like a child who cannot really understand time, he's only focused on the present, uh, then you will not take the trouble to, uh, to improve your life uh, through the elimination of contradictions. Because uh, if you just think about uh, next week or next, uh, even next month, it's really not worth the time to improve anything. Because if you have uh, stress, you have uh, anxiety, you have uh, even uh, excessive uh, weight, I mean, whatever problem you might have, uh, if you are thinking in the short term, it is usually not a good idea to invest a lot of work. Because if you are going to die, say you're going to die uh, next week or next year, why on earth should you uh, kill yourself working or building a career? I mean, it doesn't make sense, uh, rather. Right. And this is why only people who, who really take the time to think in the, in the, in the future and to think uh, what they are going to do in the next decade or the next two decades, the next 50 years, then they are ready to invest and they are ready to eliminate the contradictions in their life. Because contradictions, basically, they waste your energy and they waste your resources. But it's very difficult to do because in the short term, everything seems possible. And you can basically uh, eat, um, I don't know, French fries and, and ice cream every day and you would never get uh, sick because, say, you're only thinking about the short term. But in the long term, if you think about it, it's unsustainable. Eventually, you will get uh, the consequences of, uh, of a bad diet. But you have to think about the future. And the, the idea of uh, the extreme time preference of the children who, try, who only think about uh, the next hour, they cannot conceive the idea of tomorrow. They cannot conceive the idea of next year. A child cannot really understand what time is, what death is, what uh, becoming old is. He's beyond his understanding. And only uh, sophisticated um, human beings can think in terms of decades, in terms of a lifetime. And one of the messages I give in my book is that you can achieve, generally speaking, a human being will achieve a higher level of success and happiness if he thinks in terms of a lifetime. I mean, if you think mm -hmm. that you are going to live uh, 80 years, uh, 90 years, perhaps uh, 100 years, then you can really make great decisions because you will have the, the proper level of time preference and you will be able to invest your time, uh, your resources, your savings in the best possible way. If you think like a child and you have a time preference which is only thinking about, only looking at the immediate present, like basically foolish people usually never think about the consequences of what they do because if they feel emotional to do something, they just do it. They don't think uh, of the consequences. They just hurt someone. They just uh, uh, create problems. So they just crash their car against another car. I mean, they don't think about the consequences. You have to really have a, a shifted uh, time preference to be able to make good decisions and to be able to eliminate the contradictions in your life. Otherwise, you will not be able to invest the resources and the energies that it takes. Right. And I really love that uh, phrase that you just said, you know, that we need to think in terms of a lifetime. And I really think that in looking at that and, and thinking in terms of a lifetime, part of that goes back to how you approach the history, that we can think in terms of a lifetime, which also reflects backwards to how do we learn from other people's lifetimes and then apply that to our entire lifetime versus what am I going to do today just based off of my emotion. But are there or have you heard critics talking or asking you the question that are you positing the theory that we're taking emotions out of our life? I mean, is this a purely intellectual construct or where would emotions fit within rational living. Yes, this is a, a comment um, which is, uh, I would say, uh, the first uh, thing you hear when you talk about rationality. And I think uh, it's a misunderstanding because the, right. <clears throat> the idea of rational living is not to eliminate your emotions, but to be able uh, 
uh, to put them in the right frame. And one of the principles that I underline in my books is that uh, emotions are very good, that you should always pay attention to your emotions, but on top of that, you also have to check the facts. Otherwise, you get into this uh, romantic, uh, completely uh, wild emotional status that you see in many Hollywood movies where people do crazy things, and in the end, uh, by miracle, they are successful, and they, they manage to win the, the war, they manage to win the girl, or they manage to win the contract. This is highly unrealistic. And uh, I really, uh, very systematically in my books, I say, look, emotions are good, um, love and friendship and uh, benevolence and generosity, they are all good things, but you have to, you have to keep uh, your eyes on reality. You have to keep your common sense. You should not go crazy. And the problem is that uh, since the 19th century, uh, literature, um, uh, I mean, not only novels, but now uh, you have movies and you have uh, television programs, they, they normally appeal only to the emotions. They are highly exaggerated. Uh, if you only get your, your ethics and your philosophy from watching movies and from reading uh, novels, the ideas you get are widely exaggerated. They are not realistic. And uh, they try to entertain you but you should not take them uh, literally. They are not philosophy, they are just uh, entertainment. And it's very nice to see a romantic movie and to see, a, a, I don't know, a, an adventure movie, but this is not reality. And um, I always get the question, ah, should you not pursue your dreams? Yeah, you should pursue your dreams, but uh, always keep some margin, always keep some safety. Don't play everything mm -hmm. um, on one card, because if it goes wrong, uh, you can suffer enormous, man, enormous uh, damage, and you do, you'd never see this in movies. But the reality is that uh, you really have to think about your chances, your possibilities, and you have to assess uh, which is a good investment, which is uh, unrealistic, uh, which way should you go. Because in contrast to movies, uh, if you make mistakes, you will have to pay for the consequences. So this is why I think emotions are good, but in the end, if you want to check the facts, you have to use your rationality. And when you're making right. critical decisions, crucial decisions is very, very important. So for me, when you mention the movies, a, a question that comes to my mind, and I'll, I'll broaden it out, if I may, from just the movies into social media as a whole. But when you've done your historical studies and, and looked at different time frames in history, have you seen a decline in rationality as we hit more into our modern time because of media and social media and people focused on those uh, views of life? It, do you see any changes with that based on historical time periods that didn't have uh, you know, what we have as far as movies and social media? Well, um, before I answer the question, I have to, to uh, make a statement because um, history is not linear. Uh, when you study right. history, um, uh, I mean, for centuries, you see that, generally speaking, the situation improves, but not always. Sometimes uh, it goes backwards because uh, there were many things that uh, people knew, for instance, um, in ancient Rome, and during the Dark Ages, during the Middle Ages, uh, the, the knowledge was uh, forgotten and then it was rediscovered uh, a few centuries later. So it's not linear. But having said that, um, if you look at any period in history, uh, you see a constant uh, a parameter that the number of people who read books, the number of people who are reflective, who are thoughtful, who want to really learn, who want to improve their lives, who want to think long-term, is always around 5% of uh, society. And it, it, it could go down to 2% in the Middle Ages, or it could go down to 10% or 15% when you have a really a fantastic period in history. But usually it's a small percentage of uh, society. When you see how many people invest uh, regularly their savings to try to build uh, some uh, cash of safety uh, for their uh, old days, uh, maybe about 10%, uh, 10, 15%. How many people actually try to learn new skills, uh, try to learn uh, new things all their lives, not just uh, when they're going to college, not just when they're uh, in their uh, teenage years. How many people constantly try to improve their skills and try to learn new things? I mean, it's not many. It's maybe 5%, 6%, 7%, depending on the country. But uh, there seems to be uh, in society 
uh, this tendency, which is difficult to break, and the social media and the, the um, television and the uh, mainstream media, it doesn't really change the equation. It just uh, shifts the energies in a different direction. But it doesn't really um, matter much whether you spend your time uh, um, uh, watching uh, a, uh, a sports or playing video games or uh, participating in social media. Generally speaking, uh, people who are ambitious and who want to really uh, get ahead and to become uh, more successful and happier are going to tend to, to, to spend their time learning things, building uh, better relationships, building a better career, and most of these people are going to view uh, those um, activities like uh, playing video games or, or watching TV as relaxation that you do uh, now and then uh, when you're trying to, uh, to relax from your work, but they're not going to spend a lot of time on that. And this is a constant in history, whether you go to the Middle Ages or you go to the 18th century or to the 20th century, you will always see that uh, there is a minority of people who are pushing, pushing, trying to get uh, things done. And there is unfortunately many people who, who really don't uh, use their possibilities. Because nowadays it is so easy to learn new skills. It is so easy and so inexpensive uh, to read books, uh, to learn a second language, to learn the third language. It's really easy, but uh, you really have to focus. And unfortunately, uh, many people don't feel that it's, uh, it's worth it. It's unfortunate, but uh, unless you think long term, why should you make an effort to learn anything? So, and, and I unfortunately can't disagree with that statement. And uh, I think then what it appears that you are not only saying here, but in your books that we need to get back into that learning, into knowing more about what some of those facts and, and truths are and begin to incorporate that into our lives and to live in, in such a way. Um, you know, one of the quotes from, uh, again, your 10 principles of rational living, uh, you had talked in there, a quarter, uh, let's see, looking at the world with curiosity and independence, questioning inconsistencies and searching for truth. I really like that notion of look at the world with curiosity and independence, you know, that your freedom to be curious at what is going on in the world. And, and it seems that's what you were just mentioning. Well, um, it makes a big difference, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, whether you have this uh, – this rational approach or not, because imagine what happened um, two weeks ago. There was a panic in the stock market. Uh, the stock market went down 5%, 6%. In some areas of the world, it went down 10% within, in a day. Mm -hmm. People were panicking. They, it was the end of the world. Uh, everything is going to be destroyed. But for other people who were looking at uh, the same situation and they were thinking long term, they, they look at reality and they said, look, this is just a temporary uh, emotional reaction. Nothing is going to happen. Business is going ahead. New jobs are being created. The economy is growing. So this is going to pass. So I will just invest at this moment. And two weeks later, the market went, went up 10%. So it is only when you have this, uh, this serenity, this uh, peace of mind, this rationality, that you can take uh, advantage of these opportunities. The example I'm giving is a, an example is a very uh, anecdotic example about the stock market. But it happens uh, in your career. It happens in your relationships that unless you make the effort uh, to think long term, to think rationally, you will always panic at the, at the worst possible moment. Right. So that I think is a good tie into um, a scenario that I was thinking about. And when we apply what you've written and looking, you know, historically, people who tend to be very anxious right now and even depressed over the world affairs, like we mentioned the stock market and terrorism and violence. Based on your beliefs and, and your writings, how would you advise them to be able to find happiness and serenity given a lot of the negatives we have currently in the world? Yes, the... The reaction uh, to these negative events 
um, if you want to maintain your optimistic uh, attitude, which I think is due, you have to look at the big picture. And the problem, again, is that uh, unless you look long term and you look at the big picture, uh, you're going to be depressed and you're going to be anxious because you see a huge problem happening today uh, with really negative consequences uh, economically. Uh, some people are, are hurt or, or dead. This is really very bad. But you also have to look at the big picture, Chris. And the big picture today is that uh, the world is rapidly improving. And I'm going to give you three arguments that uh, I consider trends that are well established and they go far beyond any problem that uh, we are experiencing right now. And these trends are going to continue and society is going to continue to improve. And the first one is basically technology, uh, which is really underappreciated um, when you just live, uh, I would say, in this time where you see new products all the time. But you have to realize that uh, the shift in technological speed innovation that we have now uh, from going from uh, from uh, phones to uh, smartphones, from uh, smartphones you go to apps, from apps you get uh, to electronic uh, bookings and reservations, to, uh, I mean, you get infinite innovation at a very, very high speed, and and this is going to improve the lives of millions and millions of people, uh, and this is not going to stop. Even if you see any problem happening today in the world that seems uh, terrible, innovation and technology will continue to improve our lives, and this is not going to stop. It's going to continue like this decade after decade. And this is a very positive trend. And the second one is entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I mean, nowadays, uh, it costs very little money to, to start a business uh, anywhere in the world. You can really innovate. I mean, even if you live in a, in a relatively poor country, you can still start a business because the, the infrastructure has improved. Uh, the electronic infrastructure provided by the Internet allows millions of people to start uh, businesses with uh, low capital. And this is new in history. And this tendency to entrepreneurship, to start continuously business and to become uh, productive, is really a trend, a historical trend that you cannot stop. And this trend is stronger than anything else. It's stronger than any problems that you could see uh, in the short term. And it's going to continue in the, in the future. And the third uh, positive point I want to mention, which is also well established, is the competition between countries. And this is really great because now there is mm -hmm. such a huge uh, competition in, uh, between countries to attract investments, uh, to create jobs, uh, to increase their, uh, their wealth, to increase their standard of living, to increase uh, also the, the environment, to improve the environment. There is such a competition and such visibility also of the situation that uh, it's much more difficult uh, to go backwards. It's much more difficult uh, to abuse people. It's much more difficult uh, to to have uh, injustice and to have abuses because there is so much transparency and there is so much competition. And if people feel uh, they are not being treated correctly in one country, they move to another country and they know right. the situation and they move. Uh, and this is also new in history. You never see before in history this, uh, this transparency of information and this um, global competition. And these trends are going to continue for the next years because um, uh, this is something that has happened in history in the last 20 years. I mean, we have this uh, enormous transparency, access to information, which is wonderful. And this uh, is enough to, to keep you optimistic in any situation. Because even if you are uh, seen in the newspapers or in the, stream, in the uh, um, mainstream media, uh, the last uh, panic attack about uh, I don't know what, the trends overall, if you look at the, look at the big picture, the trends are extremely positive. And they will continue this way, and they will continue to create new opportunities, new jobs, and more opportunities for success and happiness for millions of people. Right. And and I, I really appreciate, and, and that really goes into what you're saying in, in rational living, is you're giving us three very rational, logical, based-on-fact trends versus just saying, well, you know, just be happy and life will be good or trust in the goodness of people. So personally, I really like that because that's something that I can hang on to uh, versus just, you know, that, that what I would call like the, the touchy feely sentiment of, of it all. Yes, indeed. Uh, <clears throat> I try to avoid uh, these kind of subjective arguments. Uh, I mean, this positive living, uh, sorry, positive thinking um, uh, stuff that you see now is so prevalent uh, in uh, personal development. Saying, oh, you can do it, you can do it. 
uh, go go ahead, uh, just do it, just do it. I mean, this kind of uh, approach. I mean, it's okay if you want to just uh, cheer up someone for uh, for five minutes, and it could be useful in some situations. But generally speaking, it it takes a lot of energy because then you have to keep uh, the belief uh, uh, alive. And of course, you need constant reinforcement. Someone to tell you, oh, you're going to make it, you're going to make it. And it is much better if you want to keep um, motivated and to keep working in the right direction. It is much better to have rational arguments because rational arguments, uh, if they are waterproof, they're going to keep you going, 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 and you don't need to waste your time trying to get artificial motivation. Right. So as we're coming to uh, an end time-wise, is there anything that you would like to add to this conversation that uh, you know we haven't talked about or that I haven't asked you? Yes, um, I encourage people to take a look at my work. Uh, if you just uh, type my name, John Vespasian, on Google, uh, you will find immediately uh, my books. You will find my blog that has uh, hundreds of uh, free articles. And if you want, uh, you can also subscribe to my newsletter, my free newsletter. Uh, you can get um, uh, new stuff uh, in your inbox uh, every day. But anyway, if you take a look at my stuff, just type uh, John Vespasian on Google, and you will find David everything immediately. Excellent. Uh, I do love how everything is at our fingertips in that way of uh, just type in what you want, and pretty much there's your information. So... Well, I, I really appreciate uh, the time that you've taken to uh, speak with me, to share with uh, my listeners, and really to help inform us on looking at, you know, the world from a, a more rational view. And uh, also appreciate how we ended on that positive note that no matter what's going on in the world right now, we can still find that hope through rationality. Uh, many thanks, uh, Chris. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, I think your podcast is really excellent. Well, well thank you. I, I definitely appreciate that. And uh, for everybody out there uh, listening, I would like to hear from all of you about your experiences and thoughts on this topic of rational living. Uh, please leave a comment either on this site or go to my website for access to all of my social media links. And I hope that you found this episode helpful. And if so, please spread the word by sharing with and telling your friends about this podcast. I encourage you to rate this podcast on iTunes or whichever service you use, as your ratings do help to make this podcast more visible to others. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.